my father was teaching at St. Mark's College, Mapanza, which is an Anglican uh, college. And uh, I spent about six years of my early existence in uh, Mapanza. And then after that, my father was uh, moved to Isoka and Chinsali. This is about 1965, where he opened uh, Kenneth Cowander Secondary School. And uh, after that, he went into the diplomatic service, and we went to America in 1969. I was about 10, 11 years old then. And at the time uh, when my father was uh, ambassador, uh, deputy ambassador there, the former president, uh, Lupia Banda, was the ambassador. Mm. And my father also served under Mr. Mainza Chona, who later became vice president of uh, our country. And then after that, Mr. Andrew Mutemba. And then after that, Mr. Union Mwila. Then we came back, and that was around 1972. And I went to Kabulonga Secondary School, where I finished my schooling, and then did my national service at Katete. And in 1977, I went to the University of Zambia to read law. And you'll be uh, amazed, perhaps, that uh, uh, my, one of my classmates there, distinguished uh, classmate, was uh, the present president. Uh, Is it so? Yes, uh, His Excellency Edgar Chagualungu, as well as, uh, well, among other uh, illustrious uh, uh, personages of uh, political uh, skyline, Winter Kabimba, and the president of the Constitutional Court, uh, Hilda Chibomba, was also my classmate. So that was my class. Hmm. I finished with law and then uh, decided to go into the church. I was drawn into the church. I was brought up in an Anglican uh, family and my family on my father's side, uh, three generations Anglicans. So I was drawn into the church and then I went to Oxford to read theology. And then I finished. Uh, I was ordained in London, at St. Luke's Chelsea. And then I served a curacy in uh, Notting Hill. I came back to Zambia in 1985 and was sent to uh, the Diocese of Central Zambia. And I was, became the parish priest of Luansha. This is 85 to 87. And then after that, I was um, appointed to become what we call the provincial secretary or general secretary of what is known as the province of Central Africa, which basically is the Anglican Church in Botswana, Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. I, was, uh, I went to Botswana because the then Archbishop was also the Bishop of Botswana, and that's where the Secretariat was. But although I was based in Botswana, my jurisdiction was uh, Zambia, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, so I traveled and uh, traveled extensively. Then, after some years, I was elected the Bishop of Botswana. And I served as Bishop of Botswana for about eight years. And then in 2013, uh, moved to England, where I joined the Church of England and became Assistant Bishop in the Diocese of uh, uh, Chelmsford, which covered uh, East London and Essex. And then after that, uh, two years back, uh, I joined the Anglican Diocese in Europe and became a spare bishop, so to speak, traveling around Europe. And that's been my journey. That's who Trevor Mwamba is, in a nutshell. Well, you seem and now to... I am back home. <laughs> you seem to have a very rich resume. Trust me, um, your resume is just so rich. And one would wonder, why take up a party that is considered non-existent and dead in the name of UNIP? Dead? Really? Not at all. And uh, UNIP is very much alive. Uh, we have structures uh, throughout the ten provinces. Uh, we have provincial chairman, branch chairman. It is functioning. What has happened to UNIP uh, over the years is that, uh, especially recent leadership, is that, you see, UNIP is one of, one of the unique political parties in the sense that assets, it has assets. So the president, um, uh, rightly focused on the asset side of uh, the party's uh, uh, attributes and the political side diminished 
And so what's happening now is a rebalance because UNIP is after all a political party and has been and is a distinguished party which brought about independence and ruled for 27 years. The structures are in place, the people are in place. So it's not dead. Sure, it's sure alive. The structures are in place. The structures are in place, absolutely. And as you, I'm sure you follow social media, there's a great buzz about UNIP especially among the youth, which is a great encouraging sign uh, in terms of them realizing this, as you call it, sleeping giant, and the potential it has. But, yeah, but, but perhaps I should have asked my question in this particular manner. We have over 50 political parties present currently in our country, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, one with um, a rich resume as yours, you probably would have wanted to, to join a party that is much more well formidable much more, you know, probably has even got representation in Parliament because with your wealth, your experience, obviously, you'd be welcomed by these formidable political parties. Why not Patriotic Front? Why not the UPND? Perhaps not the NDC? Very simple, because UNIP is, as I call it, uh, the grand old parent, the grand old parent, or even the grand old party. All these other parties are like uh, daughters and sons. Uh, UNIP is where they all belong and uh, where they are offshoots. But why UNIP? That's a very good question. It's the values that UNIP holds that interests me. And the values are such that right from the very beginning of its foundation, UNIP's focus has been about the person, the Zambian citizen. It's about putting humanity at the center of all things and the potential that we all possess and UNIP's policies were focused on and still are because I'm going to the values of UNIP uh, about enhancing and enabling all Zambians to realize their full potential. More profoundly UNIP's uh, values are God-centered you see, when you begin to look at the founding fathers and mothers of UNIP, they were very religious and devout people. Our first president, uh, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, his uh, father was a reverend and was brought up in the, that spirit of Christianity. Now, when you think about UNIP's policies, you see, they are very much Christian at heart. Humanism, which was the basis and the ide ideology of uh, UNIP, uh, is very much uh, an ideology that is based on values of African values. One could say, Ubuntu, mm -hmm. I am because you are. Mm -hmm. There is also a, a dimension to humanism which focused on what you might call Western uh, uh, socialism, which is also about equality, equal opportunities. But more profoundly, they are Christian principles. So when we're talking about humanism, what we, we had there was actually an expression, what we might call local theology, that the UNIP sought to instill and seeks to instill the importance of the individual, man, humankind, you and I, at mm. the center. And all policies, therefore, were uh, focused on enhancing that whether it's from the context of education, whether it's from the context of health, agriculture, everything was focused that Zambians should be enhanced. And hence, in terms of education, as I mentioned, I went to the University of Zambia, free, for free. And many of my colleagues, uh, the president himself, uh, our former president, uh, may he so rest in peace, uh, Mr. Levi Mwanawasa, uh, trained and he says somewhere that he owes that education to UNIP. So these are the values of, course. of UNIP. And these are the values I believe we need to rededicate ourselves to and to rediscover and to live in. Mm. Some political activists have argued, uh, you know, Bishop, that uh, to every political dispensation, there's a particular assignment that each political party carries. For example, the first party to form government, UNIP, the United National Independence Party, its particular assignment was to bring independence to Zambia, political independence. Where the MMD, the Movement for Multi-Party Democracy, their main role was to bring about democracy, right, in our country. We are at a phase where people believe that, yes, UNIP 
brought us independence, political independence. The MMD enhanced our democracy. But what we need now is economic emancipation. And there's no way we could go back to a party that already did its, its, its particular assignment, that was to bring us political independence. How would you respond to such political activists that analyze politics in that manner? They say that, look, now we need a party that is going to emancipate us from the economic quagmire we are currently in as a country, and not political independence. I'll beg to differ. I'll beg to differ. First, yes, UNIP is the founding party. It is the party that brought us into independence. But UNIP's uh, UNIP major role at the time, of course, was to bring about independence. Of but course. it didn't stop there. Then UNIP's major policy focus was having one independence was to bring about economic growth for all Zambians. And you must see the context that at independence there were only less than, I stand to be corrected, 100 graduates. Of course. Hence the building of the university and hence the building of the schools. Very little health uh, systems existed. You need to build hospitals. Check the mining industry and that was developed. In fact, at one point, the mining industry was one of the most successful in the world, run by Zambians. It was a powerful, so the economic development of, uh, of, of the country was the objective that UNIP focused on. So you talk about democracy. Democracy existed. Uh, we, it was a multi-party democracy at ind independence. It was only later due to um, uh, changes, uh, uh, political changes and uh, within the, the country and that we went to a one-party state. But then later we reverted back to multipartism. So democracy was always there, even under the one-party participatory democracy, uh, democracy was there. So the analysis uh, to say, well, under UNIP it was about independence, when uh, MMD came into power in 1991, then were, their focus was on democracy. One would even say, well, actually, something went wrong. Why? Well, if you look at what happened, mm. uh, UNIP itself, you, we talked about it in terms of its decline and so forth, some of that was actually uh, premeditated. It was engineered. Uh, the 1996 elections, for example, UNIP, after the 1991 elections, had 25 uh, seats in the eastern provinces. Uh, it was still formidable, and it was gaining ground. But there were constitutional changes, which you and I are very uh, aware of, in the sense that uh, uh, a threat was seen uh, that our first president would perhaps win the next election, and hence the constitutional changes that took place which barred him from uh, contesting because a provision was put that both your parents should have been born in Zambia. I mean, that in itself is just laughable. Here's a man who was president for 27 years and suddenly, oh, wow, he's not one of us. So anyway, I'm just trying to yeah, of express course, and show how in that context, if democracy was the the basis of the, you know, the second uh, uh, dispensation, we may say, that in fact it was being curtailed. Uh, but anyway, uh, as I said, I beg to differ. Yeah. But what is important, nevertheless, is that um, each party or each period in a country's history requires a, a sensitive type of leadership to address the particular challenges yeah. of that time. And so you need the type of leaders who can see what is needed and how to address those issues. And that's, uh, in that sense, yes, it would make sense. But it's not to say that each party comes in with a particular. Well, yeah. So UNIP can easily go back. UNIP can easily back to the future. We'll get back to, uh, to, 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 to the possibilities of UNIP bouncing back. But let's get to talk about, you know, um, your calling. All right, you have been called by God to the pulpit. Many are shocked that you want to leave the pulpit 
for politics that is considered as dirty. Why are you leaving the pulpit, Bishop? I'm not leaving the pulpit. Well, I'll tell you what. Politics is not really a dirty game. It's the people who make it dirty. So if you look at uh, the context of um, religion, here we're trying to draw a line. I can see where you're coming from, that uh, I belong in the church, in the pulpit, forget the other side. No, we are all political animals. We are all political animals. In fact, if you look very carefully at the theology of God, God is concerned about the welfare of his people. He is the one who's concerned about the widows. He is the one who's concerned about the orphans, you know, the fatherless. He's the one who's concerned about the suffering of his people. You find this clearly in, uh, uh, in, in, in the Old Testament, Genesis, uh, with uh, the children of Israel in Egypt and him sending Moses. And you know what he says to Moses? He says, listen, I have heard the crying of my people. And then he says, I have seen the affliction of my people. Go and redeem them. Take them to the promised land. So you see, God is concerned about our welfare. And where people hurt, that is where God is. So in short, faith, Christianity, or any true faith, any religion, is biased towards the poor, the oppressed. So if, as a churchman, I want to be involved directly in trying to bring about that change, I am, in fact, living out my ministry. If you look again uh, historically at uh, our neighbors here in South Africa during the apartheid era, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, I'm using him as a, an example. Of course. He was at the forefront of bringing about change, isn't it? and uh, fighting for justice and righteousness. Not just him, uh, people like Alan Busak, and uh, not just him in the Reformed Church, when in fact he was an Africana, uh, by as Naidu. So the church has always been, and should be, at the center of change and transformation, bringing about democracy and righteousness and justice and peace. And that is but, but my th 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 call. Th th doesn't this bring call. you at a place of conflict, all right? You stand in the pulpit to speak the word of God. And at the same time, you stand on the political pulpit to speak and garner for votes, for people to vote for you. How would this work out, really? Would you, uh, for, a, for, for a time, uh, put off your jacket as, 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 as a clergyman so that you focus clearly on your political ambitions? Let's put it this way. You see, the church is not the place for the, the way you're describing it, uh, politics. Uh, we go there to worship God, to seek his guidance, to hear his voice. And his voice is very simple. Usually it is feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the sick, the prisoner, welcome the strangers those practical activities. On, in the church, we try and ha inspire people to see their fellow human beings as the place where God is. You know why God says that? In the final judgment, uh, in fact, those who are condemned are those who fail to do that. And the reason being, God says, whatever you did the list of these, you did it to me. So when we are doing that, we're doing a godly thing. We're being very religious. When we fail to do that, then. So, that's what the church is. But, the political dimension mm. is one which is not just in the church, but it's the one we live out. The church gives us the power to live out that outside. And that's where the encounter of ideas and values uh, should take place in correcting things that are wrong and the two are not contrary, not at all. Mm. But, but, but we've seen a lot of skepticism in terms of the Zambian people getting to vote, uh, you know, for one that especially comes off from the church. I'll give you a practical example of Dr. Nevis Mumba. I think at, the, at some point, entirely the, you know, uh, 
through his, uh, you know, his conferences, Zambia shall be saved. I know you remember those conferences that Dr. Mumba used to have. But then when he was introduced to the political scene, and, uh, well, he stated that he wanted to take over the machinery of this republic. The people of Zambia still, till to date, have still said no. Aren't you, doesn't this really act as a reference point to say, I think my colleague who is coming from the church hasn't been successful. People have said no to a clergyman. And also, I want you to really analyze this question in the sense that we claim as a country to be a Christian nation. All right? Our constitution in the preamble states that Zambia is indeed a Christian nation. Why do you think there hasn't been a consensus, reaching consensus that, look, at this point, we need to put in a clergyman. First, you mentioned my brother, uh, Dr. Nevis Mumba. He's my dear brother. And it's not for me to comment. What people do, in my view, mm. is between them, their conscience, and God. Whether they fail or succeed, it's not for me to judge. However, the context of religion and politics and the role of the clergy, as I've tried to explain, of course, it is intertwined. It's about values, you see, it's what values we bring. Dr. Martin Luther King, if I may use him as an example, who was he? Dr. Martin Luther King was a great American civil rights leader. What did he do? He used he 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 would have been in Zambia accused of being a politician. Why? He, he, he led the movement to bring about civil rights for all Americans, white Americans, black Americans. And he had that dream. Remember that dream of, of his? Of course. I have a dream that one day he will live in a society where people will not be judged by the color of their skin. And his children, four children, he said, will be judged by the content of their character and what they could do. Here is a pastor. Here is a man who was trying to change the wrong within American society as it was then. Of course, years later, uh, our brother, um, President uh, uh, Barack Obama, comes about. Why? Because he is the offspring of the teaching and the values that Dr. King tried to put across. Dr. King was a pastor, a religious man. Now that is the focus that we're trying to bring up, uh, across. That You see, it depends what teaching one has. There are those who say, oh, the faith, the church, you are there on your knees and then leave it there. Politics and so forth is there. I am saying no. The two should intertwine. Are inter and it's about the values that you bring into politics. Because look at the present state. And the present state is that moral leadership becomes important. Moral leadership. Integrity becomes important in public life. If we lack integrity, we lack moral leadership. And the fact that you don't go to church, does it make it okay? Of course not. But people should be informed by these values of faith which I'm trying to put across. Mm. And these values actually are the values of love. Eh? They're the values of compassion, the values of peace, the values of justice. And where do these values come from? These are the values of God. So when you see these things being exemplified and realized in people's lives, then you know that the Spirit of God is there. Now, you mentioned Zambia being a Christian nation. Absolutely. It's enshrined in the Constitution. And I talked earlier about humanism and some of the fundamental basis on which it is founded, which President Kaunda taught, which is there, which I hold to. These values are actually the Christian values that when we put in the Constitution, Zambia is a Christian nation, President Kaunda was trying to put across mm. in terms of discipline eh? in terms of helping one another in terms of you 
humanity, mankind, being at the center of the policies of government, the economic policies, cultural policies. It is to enhance our well-being. That's what God is about, enhancing us and realizing that each child has talents which we must enable. So the role of the church, the role of the clergyman, the true ones. You know, even in the Bible, you have the false prophets and the, the true mm. prophets. And uh, the true prophets are the ones who say, no, this is wrong. We've gone in the wrong track. Let's get back to this path. And this is the path of brotherhood, unity, peace, solidarity. And that's what the church should be about. And when we're doing that, whether in church or out, we're one with God. You're taking over the leadership of this sleeping giant called UNIP. What value addition, firstly, are you bringing to the, to the party, but also to national politics? What is it that you're bringing on the table as value addition? We're reviving, we are reviving the value addition which I have alluded to, which uh, UNIP was founded on, the importance of humanity, the importance of truth, of peace, of love, of working together. Hence, in the, our UNIP constitution, there is a phrase, the slogan, one Zambia, one nation. And of course, we have it uh, when the news, uh, the news begins, one Zambia, one nation. It is to remind us of that. And so, these are the values which one wants to bring about because our society desperately needs that. What are the values? They are also the values of integrity, which I've alluded to. Uh, in mathematical terms, you know, an integer is a number that cannot be divided mm. against itself. It's a whole number. Now, when you have uh, leadership that is not complete, that is not whole, then we are in serious problems. So we need integrity. A yes is a yes, a no is a no. Moral leadership is a, a, an example in which you are there to serve God's people, to serve, emphasize to serve. And you set that by your own example. If you look again at the values of UNIP, this is a party in which you look at the leaders. None of them, you know, when they left office, uh, can be accused of having looted anything and, you know, taken things. But these were humble, serving servants of the nation. We need to get back to that. And anyone who wants to be a, a leader, a politician, should step into that uh, sphere to serve and not to be served. UNIP builds mm. on that. So what value do I bring uh, to the party or whatever? It is the value of service. My whole life has been about service. It's the values of the experience that I have uh, gleaned uh, over the years with, within the church. Uh, I was in banking for five years as a head of legal and compliance and uh, head of corporate affairs as well as secretary to the board. Uh, I've been involved in other activities uh, around the world and as a bishop within the church in terms of uh, reconciliation and conflict and uh, mediation. All those values, even music. Acting. I have mm. also appeared in a, a movie. And, and again, really, if, 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 if I sit back and get to um, think to myself how much of a successful professional you are, how much of a successful preacher you are, how much of a successful clergyman you are, it baffles me again that you would you'd want to wake up your nib, really. Um, let me ask it again in this particular way. I, I, we do know for a fact that you know, men of God are, uh, are, are humans that hear from God, right? Your coming to the political scene, could it be attributed to divine intervention by God instructing you that, my son, I want you to be the leader of this republic, or perhaps it was a conviction of perhaps maybe the current challenges that the people are passing through. Are those the things that have led you to take up the mantle of leadership in this vehicle called UNIP? Or perhaps it is 
the divine intervention coming through from God. Let us say it is both, my dear man, uh, Andrew, in the context that, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, looking to Moses, where it says, God says, look, I have seen the crying of my people, the affliction, go. So you look at Zambia's context and the economic context and uh, the corruption, endemic, the abject poverty, and you, the resources that this great country has and our failure to utilize it with full potential. And then, yes, the voice comes and says, now, young man, you have done this, I've sent you to places, you have met some of the great leaders of our time. Now, go back and see what you can do. And uh, pray, forgive me, I'm not trying to appear immodest here, but just yes. a sense of being conscious and aware of that pull. Because it's something that I have resisted. But at this point in time, it's something which I couldn't and I realized, no, this is the path that God has called me to. And guess what? It's still a calling. You know, you were mentioning about the pulpit and living. No, no, it's not a leaving the church or anything. No, it is a path that now the Lord says, this is the path and uh, this is where I am with you and you have to do something about it. Now, it, to conclude my answering of your question, I have to go back to how I ended up in the church. Yeah. Because that is, has always informed me. It is this, it's a personal story, and um, before I was born, you see, my mother was a very devout woman, a Christian woman, and was president of the, the, the Mother's Union at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross and, and all that. Before I was born, when she, as a young housewife, and um, she had a miscarriage, and uh, she thought she would never have children, so she made a bargain with God. And the bargain was simply that if God would allow her to have a child, and if that child was born a boy, she would dedicate him and give him back to God for his service. So I was born. And of course, uh, seven siblings, and there were eight of us, and uh, the last born uh, uh, sister died some years ago. May I saw rest in peace. Um, so I went through school and all that, and when I was at university with, after my law, that's when I felt drawn to the church, you see? That's mm -hmm. where. So I went into the church. And having completed, when I came back to Zambia, uh, I went to my mother's office. She worked for the university teaching hospital then. And I sat opposite her, and uh, I was in my uh, Christy attire as I am right now. So she looked at me, and then she told me, something she had kept as a secret all these years. She said, oh, my son, I am so happy that you are now a priest because you see, before you were born, then she told me, I pray to God that if you are going to be born a boy, you'll be dedicated to his service. <laughs> and then she said, and now God has answered my prayer and I'm so happy I can die a happy woman. In less than a year, my mother died in a car accident. My calling in the church, and I've always loved it, I love it, that's me, it defines who I am. But in, in answer to your question, that now puts the light on the fact that, yes, my life has been about listening to that inner voice, listening to my conscience, and listening to what I believe God wants me to do. And this is for all of us. God speaks to each and every one of us, and we must be very sensitive and conscious of that and then do what we think is the right thing for us because that that's where God is with you and so yes mm. that is the answer. as one that is potentially about to take over the leadership of this country for the next five years what is your current assessment of the economic situation in our country well my dear friend as uh, we're all aware it is uh, it, it is a, a very sad state uh, at present, you see, the copper prices are extremely high, and yet we find ourselves in this situation. And the reality speaks for itself. You're talking about millimil, 400 uh, percentage uh, rise in prices. Talking about petrol, 300, 
and uh, cement, 350 percentage points, all that. Now, then in it all is the kwacha. It has lost its value by 500 percent. So the effect on all this is, is terrible. We're looking at the context of the, uh, the public debt and the, the ratio to uh, the GDP, which has skyrocketed. And it is a terrible state. And then, of course, in terms of the, the debt uh, that we de defaulting and uh, the failure to, to pay some of these things. And uh, so all that becomes extremely worrying. And then you wonder, well, COVID, Dawson COVID-19, having come in, the crisis. And of course, that is even worse than the, the economic state. But then the question is, is this a cause of COVID? But I think the answer is very simple as an assessment of the economic state. And it is simply about bad economic management coupled with corruption. So this is the situation that needs to be changed. Mm. And we have to address this matter seriously. Uh, I've sat with ministers where you're seated, Bishop, and there are many boss that um, the government of the Patriotic Front has performed way extremely better than any government that we've, uh, we've had before in our country, beginning from UNIP and MMD. Do you agree with ministers that speak in that manner? I would try and take that same question and ask you, and uh, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Ask any ordinary Zambian in the street and say, do you believe that? I talked about the, the cost of millimil, the price increases, the fuel, cement, all these things, essential goods. Is that true? Then if you go back to UNIP, and they, they want to use us as a, as a contrast, in fact, the story could not be more so to speak, wrong, it is like day and night. The day being unique, when it was in power, the economic indices all indicate great uh, economic developments. Uh, we look at the industries that existed. Just think about all that. We used to make beautiful suits, cereals. Uh, we we had the pineapple, we nakambala, we had we assembled uh, cars, and uh, we had Zambia Airways. Uh, now, nah, well, where is the answer there? So I think it's, we have to take it with a, not just a pinch of salt, but uh, a spade full of salt. So it's a lie to assume that the Patriotic Front has performed better let us say somebody's being uh, economical with the truth. Somebody's being economical with the truth. Mm. Well, um, just on the subject of the economy, not so long ago, the president did issue a statement that um, the reason why you've spoken about skyrocketing prices of commodities, millimil, coconut, and many others, the reason why we are seeing prices is going up is because there is economic sabotage by the private sector. Do you agree with the president? The president has said that should be cause of economic sabotage by the, by the private. private sector. Well, the, the president is entitled to his own opinion, so that is his opinion. What is your opinion, really? My opinion, as I mentioned, uh, falls in the context of what I said, bad economic management simple. So who is doing that? That is for us to find out. What is your plan really in terms of, you've spoken about how huge our debt is. We've got a mountain of debt as a country. Our debt, both domestic and external debt, totals up to $18.5 billion. You spoke in your preamble about how we've defaulted in paying back our date. And it's really worrying, even as we get to the future. Potentially, you'll be president, taking over office for the next five years. What is your plan? 
Bishop Mwam, potentially indeed. Well, we need to sit down and revisit uh, the whole economic structure of our country. We need to get all the players involved uh, in mapping a way uh, forward in dealing with all this. Uh, I would say uh, to a great degree, as I mentioned about Zambia's resources, we have the capacity. If we can increase, for example, production, uh, agriculture, manufacturing, empowering the youth, and that's another area I find amazing and uh, that we must utilize, uh, giving them the ability, enabling them. This will bring about change, economic change. So this is just a brief sketch, but it's doable. Yes. And we have the means. And the cost that I asked For example, let me just yeah, also move on, just to give yeah. you an example. Of course, go ahead. I, I, I alluded to the copper prices being extremely high. You know what I foresee? You see, we caught up in this world in, in context of climate change. Uh, measures are being taken that, you know, we must address this. It affects all of humanity. I mean, uh, with what has happened with COVID and all that, it is indicative at one level that we must be very careful with nature. But climate change, that's very important. So in uh, many of the Western countries, as you may be aware, they are cutting down on this gas emissions and so forth and cars and uh, going towards electric cars. I think in England, uh, 2030, they passed uh, some law saying that all cars should be electric. Yes. Now, why do I say that? I'm talking about copper. Now, Zambia is one of the greatest producers of copper. In turning the economy around, for example, then we should think smartly and uh, subtly in terms of adding value. We should be thinking about inviting some of the industries that will be converting uh, the copper into copper wires and other components that are required to set up industries here in Zambia. I'm just talking out loud here. Uh, I would be approaching uh, organizations like Tesla to say, here you are, because then we shall be able to create jobs, enhance, uh, add value to our copper, when it's not just going wholesale, but all industry should be here in Zambia to add value. There is the tourism industry, and again, untapped. That is another area. Sustainable tourism, and especially in the areas for our local communities where they participate in the tourist industry. Not just tourists coming in and sleeping, you know, they pay out and, uh, for argument's sake, say uh, $2,000, uh, and then they come and go, and the local community has gained nothing. These are areas which we must be thinking. That hence I mentioned we need to sit down carefully with various stakeholders and say how do we turn mm. things around. The conversation really, when I was in grade five at a school called Mumana Basic School, mm -hmm. I learned about what you've taught me. My teachers- well, What have I taught you? Taught me that the reason why we are not developing at the pace mm. we are supposed to develop as a country is because we export raw materials of copper. When I was in grade nine and 10 at Mulali Boys High School, my teachers taught me that. When I was at the University of Zambia, my development studies lecturer also taught me the same thing. And I've been growing, knowing all this thing, all right? Many times I ask, when you politicians are bringing up solutions to some of the economic challenges we have as a country, you make them very simple. But what we need to do is just A, B, C, and D, Correct. all right? Correct. Why have we failed to follow that equation so that we can benefit as a country? Is it because I doubt for a fact that the solutions that you have, technocrats, don't have them. Those are working for government. What could be the big problem that we still are engulfed in as a country that we cannot progress, especially when it comes to uh, you know, utilizing the natural resources that we have as a country. What would you attribute to as a big challenge? Because I, I think we know the solutions, but why? Well, there are a number of reasons. One, of course, is political will. Uh, we, we need to implement this. Um, we must have that political will, that push. 
that enabling climate to make things happen. The other is, uh, is to do with skill sets. Uh, we need the right people to enforce these things. And in this context, uh, being Zambian, and of course having spent some time outside the country, we've got a rich human resource there in terms of uh, our people in the diaspora. Many of them are doing great things out there. We need to bring them back home, that not just them, but also within our country. There are many talented people who are not being utilized. So we must play to our strengths and our skills and our abilities and uh, enable people to do that. So one of the things, again, again as I said, political yeah, of course, will. Yeah. But we need to enforce these things and have the right people in the right places. And so in, in that context, I mean, uh, but, but, the but, but again, Bishop, is, if, 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 if we're going to drag the conversation to political will, if I know no, I that... Didn't just say yes, I said but the, but the, the right people. Of course, and yeah. it, we need to strengthen the institutions, enable them to do their work. So you'll find, I mean, this is anybody looking at things and analyzing things, yeah. is that uh, too much interference comes about. No. Zambians are very smart and uh, only... In America, uh, a while back, uh, there's a, a friend of mine who worked at NASA. Yeah? Yeah. And at Oxford, uh, a young Zambian has been involved with the whole vaccine uh, uh, process in terms of uh, finding uh, the vaccine uh, uh, cure. So I'm just saying that uh, we have a lot of talented people who can be utilized out and within and all must be encouraged to play to their uh, strengths and so that's what I mean by strengthening institutions yes. but that requires an enabling climate where the leaders give the opportunity for people to do their job and to be done and look as I mentioned especially among the youth the energy the vigor the creativity the imagination it is there we must be calling on people like you you look very young actually you look like you're 16 yeah. so people like you saying hey what do we do what should we be doing we should involve everybody. Uh, it's not for the, the foggy, the old, uh, you know, old fox uh, to be saying you must do this. No, no, we should be sitting down and uh, working out solutions and uh, engaging communities. Mm. That's my view. Let's get to your assessment in terms of um, the rule of law. What is your assessment, uh, Bishop Mwamba, in terms of the upholding of the rule of law in our country, especially as we head to this critical election. It is essential, of course. The rule of law is, is, is essential in any community, you know, and, um, I ensuring peace, stability, and so on. When the rule of law goes, then we have the law of the jungle. And then we are lost. We are done for. So we need to safeguard, you know, uh, um, institutions, the judiciary, the legal profession. They must be allowed to do their job. Uh, judges uh, should be able to be be uh, free to, to, to give uh, judgments with bias or favor and without intimidation uh, from uh, the powers that be. So the rule of law becomes very essential. But how we, how, from your own assessment, how are we performing really? I'm sorry? How are, we, how are we performing as a country in terms of well, look, Again, you look at the indicators, uh, m many of the respected uh, uh, bodies um, in the world indicate that for the past decade, for example, mm. uh, the, the rule of law in Zambia has been sliding, sliding, and it shouldn't. Uh, again, we come back, why UNIP? Because UNIP had certain values uh, that allowed the judiciary to function, and so we must allow the judiciary to function, the legal profession to function, the police to function, but not in the context where these bodies may be seen to be partisan mm. or co-opted. Is that what is happening today? I am giving you examples. But I'm asking, is that what is happening today? Uh, I'm giving examples. The yeah, reality the is there. Is the reality is, you ask, ask me a question of how, you know, the, the rule of law yeah. is important and how we must, uh, so I'm answering that question. Of course. So that is what must be done to enable these uh, institutions to function and maintain the rule of law. Now the police are there to safeguard all Zambians. They are there to protect us. They are not there to take sides. So we must ensure that these things 
are uh, upheld. And in that context, then we, we need to get all stakeholders to, you know, to, to stand up and uh, defend uh, the rule of law. And um, uh, LAS, for example, the Law Association of Zambia, is, is playing a very important role in trying to keep us on the straight and narrow. But we all have an obligation and to ensure that the rule of mm. law is upheld and nobody is above the law. What would you attribute to as reason, as reason as to why there's been a continuous, you know, decline in terms of, uh, you know, the indicators of the rule of law? What, what would you attribute to, really? Again, I talked earlier about uh, the interference and so on, but more profoundly, all this can be summed up in one word, leadership, leadership, leadership. But you need moral leadership. You need a leadership of integrity. And this is vital in moving things in any society. You need a leadership with vision and uh, a leadership with uh, that creativity to make things happen. You need a leadership that has the Zambian people at the center of all their decision making. How will this decision affect that little child in Lundazi? How will this uh, decision affect that little child in Luansha? We must look at the implications of the things we do and their wider consequences. So people with that foresight and understanding, you know, that is why I would term good leadership, they understand this. So there's no really no foresight in terms of, uh, you've confined this conversation of, you know, upholding of the rule of law in one word called leadership. The big problem we have is leadership. Is that so? Leadership, one would say, well, not just perhaps not limited just to the political, leadership in economic context, leadership in the industrial context, uh, uh, captains of industry. We need leadership everywhere. But what, what kind and of this Zambia leadership are you arises leadership? from people with integrity and values. We are here, each or one of us, to serve a purpose on this earth, and that is for the better fit, be, uh, uh, betterment of humankind. And uh, in a great nation like Zambia, and all oh, the resources that it has, we can all do it. And uh, so we need to think deep. Well, what kind of a Zambia are you seeing, uh, Bishop Mwamba, if this current leadership is to be given another five years? You've spoken about how they have mismanaged the economy, how corruption has become very rampant, how the rule of law has declined. What kind of a Zambia are you foreseeing if this current crop of leaders are given another five years? The Zambian people will first decide on that if they want the kind of Zambia that may come about the Zambian people will determine that, but you can see from where we are what the kind of Zambia that we may have in five years, just from where we are. So that well, doesn't require any genius. President. That does well, not require any genius to uh, as one predict. That and, uh, no, no, but the kind of Zambia I want to see is the Zambia, what I call back to the future, the Zambia of uh, UNIP, the Zambia where every child went to school free and the kind of Zambia where the hospitals uh, uh, worked mm. and medicine was there, the kind of Zambia where the civil service uh, performed, a kind of Zambia where, you know, uh, the KK-11, you know, won uh, brilliantly and uh, that kind of Zambia. Very the very kind of Zambia <laughs> that promoted been very the smart, artists Bishop. and uh, there are many uh, yeah, ways yeah, I look yeah, at yeah, it. You've been very smart. Zambia. You've been really very smart bishop you've, very, you've been very smart i don't know if you don't know i want to don't want to injure anybody or i don't know but you've really I, been i very am smart. A, i am a man of god i'm a bishop in that sense you see we must be very careful god is not there to fight us it's a conflict is uh, it is it, it, it's, it's a spirit that some people love that's we must raise but, but of course you uh -huh, also need to we be must raise the political narrative
mm. from uh, the boxing ring, uh, you know, approach to the one that encourages dialogue and, uh, uh, you know, uh, listening to each other. We don't need to agree with each other uh, uh, in the end, but it's to respect each other's views and know that you and I, Andrew Mwansa, brothers and my sister, whoever that may be, my mother. So we need to encourage a Zambia that allows for that um, atmosphere, atmosphere, isn't it? Sure. I think that's where we should be going. And I think in the end, uh, mm. if I may say, uh, we need to encourage um, a Zambia in the political uh, arena that allows even the parties to come together and uh, work together, whether they can work together, and at the same time, time be critical of where others are going wrong in what I may call, we must exist in what we might call critical solidarity. I hope you've also not been like the patriotic front who have been very economic with the truth in terms of addressing the critical issues that the people of Zambia are passing through. Not at all. I am never economic of the truth as you have uh, discovered as asking me all those fascinating questions. Let's get to uh, one issue that is currently very controversial in our country. That is the Cyber Security and Crimes Bill that has passed third reading. What do you make as a party hopeful president of UNIP of this current bill? The bill. Well, in short, I mean, I need, I need not go into details. It is simply to say that any bill in terms of security, security is very important for, for a nation and for the peoples within that in protecting them. But any bill that is brought about that is seen to somehow infringe uh, constitutional rights should not be um, allowed. And uh, because, again, the rights of the Zambian people are paramount. So any bills that infringe that you is not do, 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 do you think this bill is infringing on the rights of the Zambian people? The Law Association of Zambia, of which you know my first profession yeah, is law. law yeah. I hold to their position, which they took, and they simply said it should be withdrawn. So I hold to that position. Again, the rights of the individuals are very important, and we must safeguard that. No bill is... Um... Many, many, have, many have suggested that they don't know why the Patriotic Front is in a so much rush to pass this particular bill, all right? And uh, to many, it breeds suspicions that, look, probably there's something very fishy in this bill, especially now that we're headed towards the elections. Doesn't it breed any suspicion to you why, even when Parliament has, you know, uh, has gone to sleep any day, this particular bill still is, is trying to be pushed? Doesn't it, you know? It does smell rather fishy. Yes, I would agree with you, absolutely. And, uh, well, trying to push it through. But I go back to my position in context of um, any bill, any yeah. bill. Uh, which infringes uh, constitutional rights of the Zambian people should not be entertained at all. We've seen, you know, political, part, political party cadres flaunting with thousands of quarters. What does your take as party president of UNIP? Where is this money coming from? But above all, you see, each human being I see is a child of God. Each is endowed with that inalienable uh, dignity of God. In other words, uh, no one is for sale. I think any political party that uses money to try and win votes, you are demeaning the voters, and that should not be. Uh, it is about a, a, a marketplace of ideas. It's about substance. If I come to you and I say, hey, my brother, Andrew, uh, this is my view, what do you think, you know, vote for me, or, you know, you will analyze me and say, hmm, let me see what you're saying. Is there mm. substance to that? I mean, what's the benefit to me? I mean, will it enhance me? So we're talking about a, a level where intellectual, or even spiritual, or even, you know, um, um, a, a connection. And, but when I come to you and say, hey, I got a million 
watcher. This is what I want you to do. It depends on your price. You say, okay. But then, for me, that diminishes you. And it, in fact, it diminishes me as well in trying to suggest you are, you can be purchased. We are priceless. There is no price that you can put on a human being. And this just goes, goes to show the desperation of people who try to use money to get other people to like them and vote for them and do all that. Mm. That should be the case. But the, the front runners in these elections is President Edgar Chagolungo of the Patriotic Front, who is currently the incumbent. Haga in the of the UPND. Why should people not vote for and return President Lungu and vote for Bishop Trevor Mwamba on the 12th of August. Zambians are free to vote. They should vote for whoever they think has the leadership capability, uh, the ways to improve the country. It's democracy. It's not to say don't vote for X and vote for Y. Don't. The choice is up to the Zambians. They must choose wisely. But you believe that UNIP will come back in power uh, 2021? UNIP has never gone anywhere. It can come back. You know why? Are you into football, by the way? Are you into football? Yeah, of course. Which is your team? Manchester, I thought you say, Manchester oh, United. I thought you were going to say Liverpool. No, Manchester. Now, <laughs> for you Liverpoolians, uh, uh, Liverpool did not win the, the Premier League for 30 years and uh, bounced back last year and won the Premier League. Well, you need lost the elections in 1991. This is 30 years later. 30 so years later. What right. happens to Liverpool can happen to you need. Is it strategy? Or, I don't know what you call it, but I think there's been... It's sudden excitement from the young people with UNIF. Is it part of, part of your strategy to, well, engage more young people? I've had nothing to do with that, actually. But what I see is that I think God is up to something. I mean, it's amazing. But I mean, this is absolutely fascinating to see the youth uh, being fascinated by this great party. But here's something about UNIF, which maybe the youth are discovering. And it is this, that you see, after 1991, a lot was done to damage the reputation of the party in different ways. And in fact, even our founding father, you know, uh, President Kaunda, he, he suffered a lot because uh, there was just this vindictiveness uh, about it. And I remember, I was out of the country at the time, and my father wrote me a letter, he wrote beautiful letters, and in that letter he said this, Oh, my son, you don't know what's happening here. It is as if, you know, they're just trying to erase the whole memory and achievements of UNIP. And then he quoted Jim Reeves. You know, my father loved to listen to Jim Reeves. And it's that song. Uh, let me try if I can sing a little bit. You'll forgive me. Go ahead, Bishop. I'm going to change everything that holds a memory of you. Oh, yeah. I said, I'm going to change it. Everything that holds the memory of you. So that is how it was. So you need there, the young ones are discovering that, wait a minute, this is not a bad party after all. There's the move. Bishop Trevor Mwamba, thank you so much for having made time to thank appear you. on tonight's special edition of the assignment. I greatly appreciate that you found time to be with us. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. God bless you immensely. There you have it. We've been discussing Ken Will you nip? bounce back into power this year. My name is Andrew Mwansa on behalf of my producer and director Mabuto Piri for now. Good night and God bless Zambia.